Well, I'm an Indian photographer, but I have mixed origins. My father is, is Burmese, uh, and my mother is Indian. I started photography very young, when I was in my teens, and part of the reason for that was that uh, photography was available at home. We had cameras, a dark room that my father uh, had, and I just apprenticed with him and learned it that way. And then uh, my high school education was terminated fairly early, so I never finished uh, and just went straight into photography. And for many years, I was a documentary photographer, tried to make my living in India and wasn't being greatly successful until uh, I got a break with uh, uh, a French-American photo agency uh, based out of New York and then started to work internationally with uh, the magazine. Part of that experience of being a photojournalist led me to the Nobel Prize. But the other side is that um, my father was a refugee and left his country, Burma, in the Second World War. And he walked something called the General Stilwell Group, which was built by the American GIs uh, to combat the Japanese. And that road led through some, some of the areas of the Naga tribe on the Burmese side. And the stories that he told me as a child, when I was a child, that, uh, you know, as the family was walking and they were exhausted and didn't have to, uh, you know, food to eat, these tribes were very, very kind and generous with food, shelter. And I guess, um, uh, as with any refugee, uh, you know, your future is uncertain and bleak. So, these little moments, I think, can be very helpful and reassuring. So, you know, it's the, these, these sort of details that have remained in my head. And in my late 20s, early 30s, as I became more and more successful, it was a way of being able to take a sabbatical for myself to explore uh, those uh, you know, stories that I have heard. The Nagas are in a kind of uh, limbo, the younger generation especially, because somewhere they're very westernized, but they don't know what their roots are. And I think it's there at this very interesting point where the younger generation are now questioning um, you know, what their origins are. And let's see how it goes forward. My first endeavor is to be able to try and capture uh, in sort of a very classic visual anthropological manner uh, some of the things that may get destroyed or uh, you know, just disappear. Uh, so that's what I went after. Now I still continue with the project. And what I want to do is a much more documentary approach to the modern families and the way they live and have adopted the Christian faith. Nagaland now uh, is uh, probably 98% Christian, and so are the other Naga tribes in Manipur and Arunachal. There are very, very few animals left, which are all principally on the border areas. The downside is that um, uh, when the missionaries first started converting, I think they try they made out made it out that the uh, animus religion was evil, and because the animus religion relied so heavily on the kind of dress code which meant that the weaving or the jewelry making, all of these things meant uh, something visually and only the 
if you were a warrior of a certain caliber, or if you were a rich person who had given many feasts, could you wear certain kinds of fabrics or have certain kinds of objects and jewelry? All those things uh, started to get destroyed, which meant that uh, the uh, history of a people uh, was decimated. But there are, there are a lot of handsome images um, that I feel quite proud of, and part of it is because I know that just getting that image for anybody else may not happen. So, from that point of view, but one of the images that I really like is uh, the cheek or the arm of Shina Chinyu standing very proudly in his skull hut. And uh, this was in 1989 uh, when I shot this image. And when I went back a year later, the skull hut had been dismantled because the young um, villagers who had converted to Christianity kind of pressurized the old ailing chief to sort of bring it down because they felt that it was uh, a kind of, uh, they were ashamed that their ancestry was of headhunters. So for me, I think it's one of the most important images in that sense. And photographically, it's a very strong and powerful image. So for, for two reasons, I'm very, very fond of that image. I think most of my work is never quite finished because the projects can go on forever. However, you need to always sort of draw a curtain at some point and say, well, I've been able to achieve this in so much time. I think what I went out to do was very idealistic and romantic in a certain way. It was a very, very, very difficult um, terrain to work in purely because of the insurgency. You had the underground armies and you had the government of India armies and both didn't want a photographer or a journalist or anybody from the outside wandering through those uh, areas because um, they had their own kind of guerrilla warfare. And the army had to, the Indian army to uh, fight against and the um, the insurgents, um, you know, also didn't want to interact. So, uh, what would happen is if you arrived in a village, it was rare that you could spend a night over because the villagers would be very scared of having you there, partly because they would feel that if something happened to you um, in their village, then they would have trouble. The other thing is that there are roads that hit it, but from very great distances. So you have to sort of loop around for two days to get to another point, which by close flight may be just 10 kilometers away. So the hills are very deceptive, and the access to the hills are very, very sparsely duck roads. And for, for example, that if you were going to a certain village, and if one bridge was down, and these bridges are made out of uh, wood, um, you'd have to probably come back the next year. So, you know, which meant that all your planning for that year would be finished. So, the process is that you just get as much as you can, and 